as latent print development. This is actually making the print appear. Types of print. First, we have the patent print. These are the visible prints. A patent print is something that could be a fingerprint lift, left in blood, paint, ink, mud, or dust. And you can see it. Maybe you have to use lighting to see it, but you can see it and you don't have to use a powder or anything else to develop the print to where it can be seen and analyzed. These are then going to be photographed as your item of evidence. So you won't be saving that print physically other than taking a photograph. And to find these, it's a good idea to have a good flashlight or a forensic light source to hunt for these types of patent prints. Then there's the latent print. Now latent means hidden or unseen. Latent prints are undetectable mostly until brought out with a physical or chemical process designed to enhance latent print residue. Now I say mostly, often if you have like a glass and it has fingerprints on it, you can hold it up to light and actually see fingerprints, but you will still need to use a powder or some technique to bring out more the detail to where it can be photographed, lifted, analyzed. So that's latent prints. And then there are plastic prints. A plastic print is created when the substrate is pliable enough at the time of contact to record the three-dimensional aspects of the friction skin. These impressions are formed when the raised friction ridges are physically pushed into the substrate, creating a mold of the friction skin ridge structure. So that could be clay, putty, soft wax, melted plastic, heavy grease, tacky paint. Those are all substrates that could give you plastic impressions. Usually the way we collect those is we photograph those using oblique lighting, but the oblique lighting is gonna cause little shadows that we can now see when we're photographing the three-dimensional aspect of these prints. You can also preserve these after you photograph them by using a silicone type casting material. So you have your plastic print, you find it with a flashlight, you photograph it with oblique lighting, and then you can further preserve that by casting it. If you go to a crime scene, are you always going to find fingerprints? You would think so. I mean, you watch TV, you'd be convinced of it. But, but fingerprints are not always on surfaces that our suspect touches. We don't, we don't find anything. And there are many reasons why this can be. So that's what I want to talk about right now. What are the factors that help or hinder us in getting a usable fingerprint? It has to be there first, and then the challenge is for us to find it. But how, how about getting it there first? Well, there are pre-transfer conditions like the health of the donor's friction skin, the amount and type of residue on the skin. You know, these conditions are affected by age, gender, stimuli, occupation, disease, and many substances the subject may have touched prior to placing the fingerprint. What kinds of things? Well, age. You will not find fingerprints from infants and very young children. They just, their pores are not secreting oils and moisture like older children and adults. And so we seldom find any fingerprints from kids, even up to like five years old. But stimuli, are you sweating or not? Occupation, if you are a bricklayer, you lay bricks and you have those gloves with the fingertips cut out so you can grab the bricks. If you do a lot of brick laying, you can actually wear down the ridges on your fingertips. And then it's like you have no fingerprints. Now, if you quit that job or you go on vacation for an extended period of time, the ridges will reappear, but that can happen. Disease, you know, people that are undergoing chemotherapy do not leave fingerprints very readily. And then things that you may have touched before that, maybe you touched something hot that 
evaporated any moisture on your fingertips, or you may have something that is on the fingertips that's now going to obscure the fingerprint, like uh, some grease or something. Transfer conditions also dictate whether a suitable impression will be left. These are conditions of the surface, the substrate being touched, including texture, surface area, surface curvature or shape, surface temperature, condensation, contaminants, and surface residues. The pressure applied during the contact, the pressure that the person puts down as they're touching, including lateral force also contributes to can, uh, transfer conditions. So that's a factor. Post-transfer conditions, also called env environmental factors, these are forces that affect the quality of latent prints after they've been uh, deposited. Examples of these factors are physical contact from another surface, water, humidity, and temperature. Now, if your fingerprints are left on the hood of a car out in uh, Palm Springs in the middle of the summer, they're not going to last very long because the heat and the sunlight will evaporate the fingerprint, as an example. Humidity. So oh, those are all factors about the deposit of that fingerprint. How about surface types? The surface can dictate what we're going to do as well as how well it'll come out. We usually have two areas that these are broken down into, a porous surfaces and non-porous surfaces. And you need to know what your surface is so that you use the right techniques and the right processes. So what about porous surfaces? Well, a porous surface is usually absorbent and it includes materials like paper, cardboard, wood, and other forms of cellulose. Fingerprints deposited onto these media absorb into the substrate. And because of that, they're somewhat durable. They're not just all laying on the surface where they can be rubbed off the fingerprint kind of gets into the substrate. So in a way that's a little bit to our advantage. But what we're normally gonna do is go for the amino acid in fingerprints as when we're choosing a technique with a, with a porous surface. Then the non-porous surfaces are surfaces that don't absorb. These surfaces repel moisture and often appear polished. So that would include glass, metal, plastic, lacquered or painted wood, and rubber. Latent prints on these substrates are more susceptible to damage because the fingerprint residue resides on the outermost surface and it can be disturbed, rubbed away. We're going to use powders uh, or perhaps we're going to go ahead and use cyanoacrylate or super glue with dye stains. Then there's this area called semi-porous. These are substrates that don't easily fit into the first two categories, but they should be mentioned. Semi-porous surface are characterized by their nature to both resist and absorb fingerprint residue. Fingerprint residue on these surfaces may or may not soak in because of the absorbent properties of the substrate. The surfaces might include glossy cardboard, glossy magazine covers, some finished wood, some cellophane. So with semi-porous surfaces, you can use either the techniques for porous or the techniques for non-porous. So you could super glue these surfaces, you could dust with powders, or you could use the chemical processes that go after the amino acids. Then another surface issue is textured substrates or surfaces. They can either be porous or non-porous, but they present a problem of incomplete contact between the friction ridge skin and the surface being touched. So an example would be the pebbled plastic of a computer monitor, like the bezel around my computer screen is textured. The texture surface on a refrigerator, not a stainless steel, but one that has a vinyl cover, you know, it's textured. The uh, texture on uh, the dash of a, of a car. Those you can detect fingerprints, but often they're partially obscured because the finger only touched the raised areas. 
So everything in between those grazed areas is missing. Now, as far as what techniques do we use, fingerprint reagents and development techniques are generally intended to be used in combination or sequential order. Uh, so we need to know these methods. They're often specific to either porous or non-porous substrates. And if we don't do them in the right order, we can end up getting ourselves into trouble. What kinds of procedures could we use in a systematic search for latent print evidence? Well, first of all, we want to use visual inspection with a bright light or a forensic light source. So you're going to take your flashlight and you're gonna look for fingerprints. This will help us to find those patent prints, the visible ones, also any plastic prints, because we'll see that with oblique lighting. It may also help us to find latent prints that become visible with the light that then have to be developed. But don't count on that being the only way to know where to dust. The, the key on dusting is dust where you think the suspect touched. And so if you're using this visual inspection first and you don't see anything where you think somebody touched, don't stop. You still need to dust because the latent prints may not have appeared with your flashlight or laser. Then you're going to use latent processing. You know, there is the using powders, there's using chemicals, there's the glue fuming. And then we uh, also document the developed prints at each step. So things we're gonna consider when we decide on a uh, processing uh, method is the type of latent print residue suspected, the type of substrate, the texture of the substrate, the condition of the substrate, you know, is it clean, dirty, tacky, sticky, greasy, environmental conditions during and following the latent print deposit, length of time since the evidence was touched, consequences of destructive processing methods, um, sequential ordering of reagents, and the seriousness of the crime. So we're thinking about all sorts of things as we go through this process. And it's stuff you learn along the way. A lot of it you're taught by your field training officer. Typically you'll get hired, they'll send you to some training. Then you're, then you're with another CSI who you know, has been a CSI for years. And usually that CSI says, forget everything you already learned. I'm gonna show you the right way to do things. And then you go through all of that. And then you, you pick up on all of these nuances. As far as the handling goes, you're going to use gloves. It's going to protect the evidence from contamination. Uh, that's from you. And it's going to protect you from the evidence or the chemicals you're using. So uh, gloves are important. Just because you have gloves on doesn't mean your fingerprints are safe because you can damage fingerprints with your gloves. So if you have a fingerprint on a, on a non-porous surface, especially, and you put a glove right over it, you can smear it, you can smudge it. So just because you're wearing gloves doesn't mean the fingerprints are protected. You still have to handle the object appropriately. Uh, packaging, but this ensures the integrity of the evidence by keeping contaminants away, keeping trace evidence intact, and helping to guarantee the chain of custody. Now, when you are packaging things to take to the lab for dusting or other chemical processes, you need to package in such a way that you're not going to damage the print. So if you have something like a drinking glass and you wanna package that, you're gonna to have to figure a way to put it in a container like a cardboard box where it's not gonna roll around, Areas that may have fingerprints are not gonna come in contact with the edges of the box. You may have to devise something with other pieces of cardboard, but you need to be cognizant of the possibility of damaging your latents as you transport them. And then another issue is the composition of latent print residue. So the composition of sweat that is deposited when friction-rid skin makes contact with a surface 
is a complex mixture. Recent studies have identified hundreds of compounds present in human sweat. As far as fingerprints go, nearly 99% of the print is composed of moisture and oil. This water is going to start to evaporate after the deposit. The print just starts drying out. That's why when you go and dust an area that maybe people have been touching for years, you don't find many prints because someone has touched that years ago, it's going to evaporate away. Now it's true you can find fingerprints a long time later in some remote obscure cases, but typically that does not happen. So you need to dust for prints as soon as possible. Now, if you have a dried out print, there are ways you can still get something and that's with chemicals. When we use something like ninhydrin, that re reacts with the amino acids that are part of that last 1% of the fingerprint, then we can get our fingerprints. So often things like paper, if we do the amino acid technique on, because that's pretty typical for paper, that paper could have been handled you know, months before, and you can still get a result.